Welcome to Interactive Storytelling. Last time we visited ancient Greece and saw Aristotle's take on tragedies. This time we jump much ahead in time to the beginning of the 20th century. This is not to say that nothing worthwhile happened in the two millennia between them. On the contrary, the reason why I'm picking up the story here is that the 20th century saw a tremendous amount of research work happening in science in general, as well as in story analysis in particular. If we would have to pinpoint a place and a time, we could take the post-revolution Russia or Soviet Union in the 1920s. During those years, before the suppression of sciences and art that the rise of Stalin brought along, a new school of thought emerged. It was interested in analyzing the structure of stories to find out if there's something common among them. This school is called Russian formalism. It had later a major influence, for instance in France, where it evolved to an approach called structuralism. Russian formalism divides the story into three layers. The first layer is called fabula. The second layer is called shuset. And the third layer is called media or text. Let's begin with fabula. In fabula we have the events caused or experienced by the characters in a chronological order. In other words, we have a timeline which runs here from top to bottom. Along the timeline we have events that take place in the story. First we have event A, uh, that is then followed by event B, C, D, E and F. You can imagine that between these events happens much more, but these events are the ones relevant to the story. All these events are arranged in Suset. You can think of this arrangement as the plot of the story. The events aren't necessary in the chronological order at all. We could start the plot with event B, which is then followed chronologically by event C. In Shuset we can play with time and logic. Instead of continuing with event D, we can go back in time and take an earlier event A. Or, to use a familiar term, we make a flashback to event A. After the flashback we continue to event D. We are not limited in going back in time, we could go also forward in time. Let's take next event F. This turn in the story we can call a flash forward. After that the story ends with event E. The difference between fabula and shuset should be clear now. In Shuset we have the narrated events as they are presented to the audience. In Fabula we have the events as they would have occurred in the real world. As a home exercise you can take a film and try to map its events uh, first as Shuset and then as Fabula. You could try to do this to Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction or Christopher Nolan's Memento. The third layer corresponds to the surface of the story as it's expressed in language signs, as a text, or via some other media such as a film. Russian formalism influenced the main character of this video. Vladimir Prop was a Russian structuralist who was especially interested in Russian folk tales. He wanted to find a common structure in them, so he started analyzing their structure one by one. 
The results were published in his book Morphology of the Folktale in 1928. When the book was translated from Russian to other languages in the 1950s, it encouraged many others to study in morphology in a similar manner. The core of Prop's morphology are 31 narrative units or narratives that occurred in the analyzed folktales after the initial situation. They are the basic primitives which tend to occur in the same order in the stories. Each of these narratives have a symbol, a Greek letter, an arrow, a Latin letter or two letters. The structure of a story can then be presented as a sequence of these symbols. The narratives form spheres dividing the structure of the story into four phases. The first phase is the introduction, where the situation and most of the main characters are introduced and the scene is set for the subsequent adventure. The second phase is the body of the story, where the main story starts and extends to the departure of the hero on the main quest. The third phase is the donor sequence, where the hero goes in search of a method by which the solution may be reached. The hero possibly gains a magical agent from the donor, which could turn out to be useful in the struggle at the end of the donor sequence. The fourth phase is the hero's return, where the hero returns home, possibly facing a final task in order to receive a hero's welcome. Let's take an example sequence and see what kind of a structure it represents. The first part of the sequence is Delta, Eta, Theta. In this introduction, the villain of the story succeeds in deceiving the victim of the story. The next part of the sequence is C, belonging to the body of the story. Here a counteraction begins and the hero begins her search for the villain. The next part is D, E. This is the beginning of the donor sequence and the hero is tested to find out whether she is worthy of receiving a magical agent. The subsequence HJ marks the ending of the donor sequence. The hero fights the villain and wins, but gets injured. The last subsequence down arrow O, L, Q, X corresponds to the hero's return. The hero returns home, but a false hero has taken her place claiming the credit for the victory. At the end, the real hero is recognized and the false hero is exposed. These are the bare bones of a story. If you want, you can now build a complete narrative out of this by adding more details, descriptions and dialogue. As you could see, the stories made with the narratives have a closed set of characters. They are defined from the point of view of their significance to the course of action. Prop lists seven character roles. Villain, who struggles against the hero. Donor, who prepares the hero or gives the hero some magical object. Helper, who helps the hero in a quest. Princess and possibly her father, who gives the task to the hero and is often sought for during the narrative. Dispatcher, who makes the lack known and sends the hero off. Hero, who departs on search, meets the donor and returns home. False hero who takes credit for the hero's actions. 
All of these roles don't necessarily have to appear in a story. Also, more than one character can appear in a particular character role. This part of props morphology has been criticized because the character roles are classified based on what they are and not what they do. AJ Kramers is one of the critics and his actant model tries to give a better answer that is based on the roles. He recognizes that stories have six actants. The first one is the protagonist of the story, who is the subject and who is seeking for an object. The sender has dispatched the subject on this task. The subject should deliver the object to a receiver. The subject gets aid from the helper while the opponent acts as an antagonist to the subject's efforts. Despite the criticism, Vladimir Prop's work provided inspiration to many researchers and initiated many lines of, of study. For instance, Bian Kolbe studied the folk tales of Alaska natives in the early 1970s to map out their narrative elements. His model is more fine-tuned than Prop's, but not as widely known and influential. Also, in the 1970s began the research work on story grammars, initiated by David E. Rammelhardt. The idea is to give a general framework with a hierarchical ordering of story elements, which are related causally or temporarily. Apart from breaking down the story into its constituent parts, a story grammar also gives rules for generating well-formed stories. The major problem of story grammars turn out to be that they are applicable to simple stories with a single protagonist. Prop's morphology has influenced also the research on interactive storytelling. Several storytelling systems have taken the narratives as a starting point for implementation, with varying results. Often it has turned out to be too restrictive for practical use. This concludes the topic of this video. In the next one, we take a look at two other structuralist approaches to analyze stories. See you there.